Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chris Sepper, CEO of Med City Media and publisher of MedCityNews.com. Thank you very much. And how about some applause for that rain? Come on. Thank you very much, everybody, for making it through the rain. I, you, we have great stories. If you've been talking to your uh, peers and colleagues in the audience, uh, missed flights. Uh, one of our speakers today was in the airport in Boston, and there was a converge attendee with her. Their flight gets canceled, and she's like, we're driving. Came overnight and drove. And so I, under, I appreciate your perseverance, and I appreciate your attendance here at Converge. Uh, as I said, my name is Chris Sepper, and I founded MedCity. Uh, so it's, it's personally gratifying to see you come here um, under the banner of the conference. Um, but I think your presence here, uh, in all seriousness, is a testament to the transformation that's happened in healthcare. Because think about this, five years ago, seven years ago, where you were in your career, many of you would never have thought of going to a conference like this. Why would a, why would a payer, why would a CEO from a major health system uh, spend their time at a conference that's gonna drill down on telemedicine and then on wearables um, and then talk about uh, personalized medicine and, and, and jump what would seem like a schizophrenic conference five to seven years ago. Why wouldn't people in insurance just go to AHIP? Or why wouldn't you, if you were in life sciences, go to bio? Or why, if you were a CIO, uh, go to HIMSS? Because this isn't a conference of your peers. This is a conference of your allies. And this conference, a true innovator today in healthcare, needs not only to master their domain, but to understand how innovation is transforming the ecosystem, the industry. There really wasn't even an ecosystem seven to ten years ago in healthcare. It was a bunch of silos. Uh, but everybody in this room knows technology, healthcare reform, issues like expiring patents and being paid for value versus service have all transformed what healthcare is about. Um, and that's why we gather you here today um, and why we built a program to empower you. Converge is one place where we want you to get the most accurate picture of where healthcare innovation is going, because that's what's necessary for healthcare, for the business of healthcare to succeed today. Um, and that's why we've gathered, not only in our podiums, but in this audience, the doers in healthcare. And you're going to be able to take things away when you listen to what people are doing right now in wearables, right now in population health, right now in personalized medicine right now when it comes to health insurance innovation or hearing from our keynote CEOs of major health systems looking to innovate in ways they wouldn't have, people in their position wouldn't have five to seven years ago. So again, thank you for participating in this conference. Thank you for coming here. And my promise, my pledge to you is that you're going to walk away today with something and you're going to come back to your organization and you're going to make change right away because that's the mission of this conference, and I know that's why you're here. That's why you've hired me to do this job for you, and I'm grateful for it. Um, this isn't a one-way street, though. Converge is an interactive conference. First, if you're on social media, MC Converge is our hashtag. We will be pulling questions directly from that Twitter stream and asking our panelists to participate. But not only that, as you know, MedCity isn't just an events company. We have a site, medcitynews.com, where as many as 400,000 people every month are coming. We are broadcasting portions of this conference live to that audience. Um, not only our keynote speakers on stage, but you'll see we have sessions that will be going on during the breakouts, covering issues like the Sunshine Act, population health. There will be opportunities for you as attendees to join in some of these sessions to participate um, when we seek feedback on day two. Our Converge audience online is watching this now, and they'll be participating with us as we go. That is the nature of healthcare innovation today. It is not a real-time experience. It is not an online experience. It is a collaboration. It's a collaborative experience. We have a series of great sponsors. Without them, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be able to put on a show that we did today. Uh, GE Healthcare Global Services, Independence Blue Cross, United Healthcare, great partners like Thomas Jefferson Health System, Safeguard Scientifics, the Consulate of Canada, 
the University of the Sciences, organizations like MD Align and Owls Better and Movable, Liberate Health, Logic Junction, Razor, Razorfish Healthware, Stone Arch, and the Greater Philadelphia Life Science Congress. That, that group of sponsors is as diverse as this audience itself is, and we feel fortunate they've come under this banner. Um, and, and last but not least, one of the identities of MedCity has always been early stage innovation. Um, my last count is we had at least 75 startup companies in attendance. I bet it's even higher than that. More importantly, we have two dozen of them in the networking area. Listen to them and the unique problems they're solving. Uh, they're chosen almost exclusively by the editorial team at MedCityNews.com uh, as um, ideal companies that are solving real solutions in healthcare. I'm very excited to introduce our first innovator who's going to speak today, uh, a man I've, I've enjoyed meeting and getting to know, and you are going to be amazed by his conversation. His name is Dr. Stephen Clasco. Dr. Clasco is the president and CEO of Thomas Jefferson University and the Jefferson Health System. He previously serves as the CEO of USF Health and the dean of the Marsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. And he was also the Dean of the College of Medicine at Drexel University. He is a board certified and actively practicing OBGYN. Um, and after graduating from the Wharton School of Business, Dr. Clasco received several grants looking at how physicians respond to change, one of the key issues that obviously we have talked about in innovation. Um, and then those grants actually resulted in a book uh, called The Phantom Stethoscope, Creating an Opportunistic Future in Healthcare. I'm excited that Dr. Clasco has chosen to spend his time with us and kick off our conference. Please, everybody welcome Stephen Clasco. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, actually, uh, I am now the uh, CEO of Stevie's Vinyl Emporium and Implantable Health Chips here on South Street in Philadelphia, uh, having spent the last 10 years uh, as president and CEO of Thomas Jefferson University. And I'm here to tell you you can all relax, because everything worked out for us in healthcare in Philadelphia. And by the way, it, it wasn't necessarily a disruptive technology, although there were plenty of those in, between 2014 and 2024. There's really a few things, some of which I'll talk about today. One was conferences like this, where we all start to get together, insurers, innovators, and academicians looking at hey, why don't we look at what's going to be obvious 10 years from now instead of 10 years in the past? It was actually starting to take some lessons from other industries, not just looking internally, whether it was aviation or finance or even sports. And finally, the burning platform that existed of decreased NIH funding, decreased clinical reimbursements, and the inability to continue to increase tuition didn't hurt either. But let me just talk to you about my journey, because it really, for me, started um, in 1977, I was the president of the American Medical Student Association. Um, I was a huge Rolling Stones fan. I was actually a disc jockey. This is what the Rolling Stones looked like in 1977. And somebody asked me to give a talk, it was in Philadelphia, about the future of healthcare, looking at it from a medical student's point of view in 1977. What would things look like 20, 30 years from now? So I talked about some things back in 77. Can you do anything about spiraling costs? Can you change the fee-for-service system? Uh, can we really measure outcomes? Um, and interestingly, I was very nervous about the talk and went to a movie that nobody thought would make it. It was a little bit of a weird uh, science fiction movie called Planet of the Apes. I remember that helped me relax. So here we are in 2014, went through a managed care revolution, went through something called Obamacare. And what I would normally be talking to you about, this is what the Rolling Stones looked like in 2014, what I would normally be talking to you about is, can we do anything about spiraling costs? Can we change the fee-for-service system? Can we measure outcomes? Wow, and then I thought, God, that's 37 years, and not much has, uh, has changed. Now, one thing has actually changed uh, since 1977. And by the way, this in 2014 was the uh, number one grossing so, boy, that really, things have not changed in, in 37 years. One thing has changed. This is what I look like in 1977. And one of the things about getting old is I don't really miss the hair, but I really miss the car. For those of you car fans, this is a 1968 GTO. I wish I had kept that. 
So, but what about 2024? What I'd really like to talk to you about, and the reason they invited me here, is to really give you a little bit of what's happened in 2024. So here we are. Uh, this is what the Rolling Stones look like now on the zombie tour. Uh, it's really been very successful for them. And what really was the aha moment for me was giving a talk in 2013 and listening to someone say, you know, the two things that are impossible over the next few years are academics and healthcare. And I said, damn, I just took a job in academic healthcare. But fortunately, I found a really good marketing campaign from Adidas that said, impossible is a big word thrown around by small men and women who find it easier to live the world they've been given rather than explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is temporary, impossible is nothing. All of you are here because you believe that we can do the impossible in healthcare and turn it into a very entrepreneurial, team-based approach. And I believe that also. So let me tell you what's happened in 2024. First of all, everybody recognized that we were unprepared. We needed to be a highly prepared. The places that thought a miracle was going to occur don't exist anymore in 2024. So it's July 15, 2024. We're at the 13th MedCity Converge. This is a little bit what's going on for those of you who haven't time traveled. President Jenna Bush is a debating Democratic nominee Chelsea Clinton in a tight race. Harrison Ford has signed on for one last Indiana Jones sequel, tentatively titled Indiana Jones, The Legend of Bingo Night. And the Eagles are 2-0 and trying to win their first Super Bowl since their unprecedented fourth straight they won from 2015 to 2018, the so-called chip championship years. Go, go, go Eagles. But more importantly, as it relates to this conference, Philadelphia and Jefferson is celebrating its 200th anniversary in 2024. Yes, we, we started back in 1824 as a statewide national international hub of innovation with its headquarters in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has become a destination site for innovative entrepreneurial health with unprecedented economic development for the city. And creative partnerships have allowed us to become what was called in 2023 a thriving cluster on the verge of a chain reaction, according to the Wall Street Journal, helped make Philadelphia the epicenter of the new healthcare. Oh yeah, and I'm getting out of my DeLorean to accept an award from the US News and World Report, which by the way, is very, very different parameters than existed in 2024. So how do we get there? Well, I'm going to talk about three things that really were pretty logical. First of all, we decided, since so much of healthcare is based on doctors and nurses and providers, but especially physicians, why don't we actually start to look at creating the doctors of the future? So we look back in time, and you look at uh, the TV shows. What were the TV shows in the 70s about doctors? Anybody remember? Anybody my age? Marcus Welby, right? Okay, good. So, so here's Marcus. Uh, Marcus was a family doc. He would get up in the morning, go to the homeless shelter, take care of people for free. On the way home to lunch, he would deliver a calf because the cow was having trouble. He would then go to his primary care office in the afternoon and do left ventricular neurosurgery at night. That's how people viewed us. We were gods. We could do everything. By the way, we were never that. Then you fast forward to, to the 2010s. We got a house, right? So if you came down from Mars, you'd think we were all really smart, narcissistic, sex addicted, drug addicted, not very nice people. Um, so how do we get there? Now, of course, in 2024, almost all of medicine is done robotically, and the only reason for doctors is to deal with the human aspects of it. So we looked back in 2024 and said, isn't it a little strange that doctors in 2014 were chosen based on three criteria, science GPA, MedCats, a multiple choice test, and organic chemistry performance, and somehow we're all amazed that physicians aren't more empathetic, communicative, and creative. My kids would say, duh. And then we put them through a surgical residency. And ha having gone through one, I can tell you that uh, empathy is not the thing that is taught first in, in, in most, uh, in most uh, medical residencies. So, so, so what can we do? So part of the research that I had done is what makes physicians different than other people as far as how we handle innovation and change? And simply put, the way we select and educate physicians, we've joined a cult. And that cult is real, really around four biases. A competitive bias, an autonomy bias, a hierarchical bias, and in some cases, uh, we've had the creativity sort of thrown out of us. At the end of the day, all four of those biases back in 2014 inhibited our ability to embrace exactly the things that you're going to be talking about over the next two days. In fact, back in 2014, we did a study where we showed that 70% of physicians practicing three years or less felt they didn't learn what they needed for, for future practice. They learned 
microbiology, biochemistry, and OBGYN and cardiology, but not how to manage change, not how to negotiate, healthcare financing, not even how to effectively communicate, make patients happy. Almost all physicians in 2024 are part of a larger organization. We didn't really teach them how to be an individual in an organization, how to do leadership development, even how to run an effective meeting. So as one of them said, well, you know, you really sort of ripped me off. I have $250,000 worth of debt, and you taught me exactly half of what I need to know. So we decided to change some of that. First thing we did is we started some partnerships with some places that had looked at things very differently. Southwest Airlines, who went from choosing pilots totally based on mechanical ability to looking at communication and, and second and third order consequence skills. Telios, and believe it or not, the art and music community, because we recognized that just seeing something is not necessarily observing. And here's just some of the things that we did, both at Jefferson and at USF. We transformed emissions. We basically started to look and say, what are some of the things that will make someone a good physician? And yes, you have to have a certain minimum of science, knowledge, and ability. But how about self-awareness and self-management and social awareness and relationship management? To the point on, in one of my organizations, actually part of the admissions committee were folks from Southwest Airlines and folks from industry that had really looked at that kind of thing. And then we totally changed the curriculum, recognizing that half of what we teach in medical school, especially the first two years, can all be done online. We have the similar curriculum in 2014 that we had in 1958. So we started to teach health system competencies, because you know what? It was very clear by that time that running health, a healthcare organization or being a physician really involved healthcare delivery, organizational structures, systems and process engineering, population health and personalized medicine, which you'll hear that is, uh, are not mutually exclusive, technology, population, and pop public health. We taught patient-centered care competencies. Patient-centered care went from being a marketing campaign to being what we do. So we started to understand the cultural aspects of somebody's health. We started to understand some of the ethical aspects, the health literacy aspects, working in teams. So we looked at access, outcome disparities, care continuum. Population health was not any more an eccentricity in a medical school's curriculum. It was really the heart of a medical school curriculum. And we realized that doctors are leaders. Doesn't matter whether they're in administration or whether they're leading their practice. And we start to really look at their personal development, their emotional intelligence, their ability to work as a, a, a leader and a follower in an organization. And then we really added another component that actually ended up being one of the most successful. We started to look, taking this quote from Steve Jobs, follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you want to become. Everything else is secondary. And realize that almost everything we taught had been on, been on the right side there, or the left side there. Linear, empowerment of ambiguity, ability to see the trees, literal, rational. And we really started to look at how we can make physicians more intuitive, power of ambiguity, imaginative, bedside oriented. So one of the things that we did, which was very successful, is we put art into the curriculum of, of, of medicine. Think about this for a second. Seeing a picture or seeing a piece of art or listening to a piece of music versus feeling that piece of music or feeling that art or interpreting that art is very, diff very, very different. But for a physician, that's probably the single most important thing. I can look at somebody, I can listen to them, but if I'm not observing what they're telling me, if I'm just looking at the data and just looking at the ultrasound and just looking at the, um, at the lab tests, that's not going to help me. So we actually created what we call the art of attending. And we actually used it as a selection criteria. Getting back to that emotional intelligence piece, if somebody looked at this picture and they said, what do you see? And all they could tell us is the forms that they see. I see a woman in a white dress. I see a snake. And they couldn't get beyond that. And that was probably not somebody who was going to be a good physician and be able to observe. That became a very, very major part of what we did. We, in essence, created physicians of the future instead of physicians of the past. And now, in 2024, we've been able to deliver very team-enabled health care. Doctors work closely with multidisciplinary care delivery teams and emerging health professions. And by the way, the uh, Institute for Emerging Health Professions, which started in Jefferson 2014, really helped develop many, many of those skill sets. We also embraced entrepreneurship. Instead of fighting all the new things in academic medicine, we embraced them. One of the first things that we embraced at Jefferson was telehealth. We, we thought about this for a second, and we said, it's sort of amazing that the Friday after Thanksgiving, 
You can be in your pajamas watching Game of Thrones and doing all your holiday shopping. But if you happen to have a stomach ache, you still have to get on the phone, hope that somebody answers the phone, go in, drive to a doctor's office. We did, with our medical students, some mystery shopping. Everybody knows what that is. It's, you know, what places like Vogue and others do, looking at shoppers. We did that with our patients. We made every medical student, every medical student, do mystery shopping with their patients, where we would take patients that were going in for exams and have them write their thoughts. I'll give you two things that were aha moments back in the 2010s for those students. One was a woman going in to get her woman's health exam, and she was having a mammogram. In Florida in 2011, the average amount of time from the time you got a mammogram to the time you got results was 7.2 days. By the way, it takes about two minutes to read a mammogram, but part of the reason was the way that we did things was physicians would batch read and wait until there were enough mammogram, enough mammogram or x-rays to look at. So the patient got the digital mammo. The tech said, gosh, you know, we might have to do um, magnification views. She said, that doesn't sound very good. So well, when will I know? Well, it's Monday. Physicians batch read on Wednesday. I'd give it, I'd give it four, four or five days. She said, I don't mean to be rude, but there's a guy with a white coat over there that looks suspiciously like a radiologist drinking coffee. Is there any reason he couldn't come and look at this? Tech went over, uh, brought the doc over. Doc looked at it for about two minutes, said, this is perfectly normal. See you in a year. She wrote a paragraph that was incredibly poignant that I still have in 2024 about the difference in her world about waiting four nights since her aunt had had breast cancer and what that meant to her and what that would have meant to her on the job or at home versus finding out at that moment. There was an, an, even another one that was another aha moment around customer service. Back in Florida in 2012, we had the state's Alzheimer's Memory Disorder Center. It was called the Bird Memory Disorder Center. And one of the mystery shoppers had a parent that was afraid she was losing her memory. She wanted to get screened. If you called the Bird Memory Disorder Center in Florida in 2012, this is what you got. Welcome to the Bird, the state's Alzheimer's and Memory Disorder Center. Please listen to the following 11 options before you make your choice. So by definition, if you got, if you got an appointment, you didn't need one. And there are a lot of confused people walking around Tampa. So, so when you think about it, some of the things that we started to do at Jefferson and throughout Philadelphia were really just embracing the entrepreneurship that had existed already in so many different in industries. One of the areas was, was telehealth, because we recognized that the consumer experience that exists um, among many things that we do in health, of actually having to drive into Philadelphia, get seen for, let's say, sinusitis or whatever, doesn't make any sense. In fact, this is what it looked like uh, back when we started. Back in 2014, everybody was excited about what is the internet going to do for healthcare? It's going to be great. Well, it really wasn't great because patients got a huge overload of information. I'm an OBGYN. My area of interest in research was around premenstrual dysphoric disorder, premenstrual syndrome, and some of the neurotransmitters. And I was at a conference in 2012 where they actually uh, talked about males getting PMS also. There were 15 talks. That was the worst talk. It had almost no science to it. But that got sensationalized because that was a good headline. So there it is. Study shows males can get PMS also. Then, of course, it gets picked up by the print media. Horrible study, but that's what people were seeing. Now, this is the only medical slide I'll show you, but this is a, a woman's reproductive cycle. And as you can see, that every single day, if you put a solid line through that, there's totally different hormonal milieu. And it's not just the reproductive organs, it's the brain, it's the heart. So really, that's the basis for all the neurotransmitter data on, on, on premenstrual syndrome. This is how interesting uh, males are. This is our, our hormonal piece. So literally, what people were getting through the internet was almost totally ridiculous. And then we said, OK, but what about the consumer piece of it? Oh, that's great. Let's do, let's do Zagat surveys of doctors. So we can not only have restaurants, nightlife, and shopping, but surgeons radiologists, gynecologists, et cetera. And while that was somewhat helpful, it got to the point of ridiculousness, including this cmyop.com. I'm pleased to announce my latest venture, cmyop.com. It's intended to be the first social network site that lets members share their surgical procedures live with friends and followers, both on cmyop.com as well as on a user's other networks to stream live video from surgical scopes and instruments over Twitter and Facebook. 
So your last moment of privacy, your, colon your colonoscopy, was no more. What we totally missed back then, what we totally missed back then, is that patients under 40 expected healthcare to act as a consumer sport. And back actually in 2013, we had, did, we had done a study, a national study, looking at what patients under 35 expected, and 71% expected doctor's visits to have online scheduling with comparative rates by 2014. 65% expected there'll be social networking opportunities to discuss health-related topics and compare providers. 92% expected to have two-way electronic communication with their providers. 83% expected they'll be able to access their patient information as they do their bank accounts online. And over three quarters expected that they would have total access to family members' inpatient charts and rounding. Why not? When you think about it, that's what they have in every other aspect of their life. They have that level of connectivity. Why not health? So we decided to embrace that at Jefferson and really take that on seriously. And we started to look at a much more patient-centric approach. Literally, not anymore that we own the records, but literally we recognized, and the way it is in 2024, by the way, is everyone has their health records like they have their, um, their bank accounts. And um, if they see me as a physician and choose to change uh, their physician, no records have to get changed. It really just changes their password, just like they would at any other aspect of their life. So we started to look, and very early on in 2014, we devoted, even as an academic medical center, one of our top three strategic initiatives was not necessarily just on telehealth, but on enhancing the patient-provider experience, on saying our number one job at Jefferson is not to be a hospital system in Philadelphia. Our number one job at Jefferson is to help patients be healthier. And if that means at the home, if that means at a kiosk, if that means at their job, we have to do that. Actually, the hospital is where they go, in many cases, if we fail doing that. So we started to look at not having these kind of experiences anymore. I don't feel so good. Well, then you need to go to a doctor. Uh, yeah. Mr. Stephenson? Stevenson. Do you have any allergies? How would you describe your symptoms? What is the general area of pain? Does your family have a history of heart disease? Does your family have a history of diabetes? And what seems to be the problem today, Mr. Stevenson? I'm feeling a little stuffed up. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I'm uh -huh. doctor at 3 o'clock is early at 2.45 is late from 6 and 7. Follow these instructions and if you clear up in a week, you should come back and we'll do this all over again. I don't like going to the doctor. And a lot of people said that. So, so what did we do? We started looking at creating an innovation-driven system of healthcare to the point where patients in 48 states across could access Thomas Jefferson doctors via a telemedicine approach that we partnered with. Well, now you can see a doctor without going to a doctor's office with the help of your smartphone or computer and American Well. Signing up and setting up your health profile is easy. It only takes a minute, and once you've done it, it's stored safely and securely. Then you can log in or use the app to see doctors who are available and connect by video, phone, or chat. Hi, Alan. I see you've been experiencing some congestion and some nasal blockage. How long has this been going on? During the visit, the doctor can see your health information. Afterward, you get a complete write-up of everything the doctor says. Well, it looks like acute sinusitis, a sinus infection. Now, I wrote you a prescription to help with the congestion. If things don't clear up in, say, a week or so, just send me a message. I'll be right here. A few minutes later, I've got my diagnosis and my instructions for treatment. And my prescription is already waiting for me at the pharmacy. So why were we able to do this at Jefferson? Part of the reason we were able to do this at Jefferson is we totally moved away from a university and hospital mindset, merged both of them, and created a four-pillar model, academics, clinical, innovation, and alternative sources of revenue. So actually, this started with the innovation pillar with an investment, came into the academic pillar because we started a national telehealth academy. What are some of the jobs that will be needed in a, new, in a new world where a lot of care is given at home? Had that help with the clinical piece because we started to get patients through this telehealth initiative and then obviously created some new alternative sources of revenue. We started in 2014 with management of our covered employees where from 5 p.m. to midnight, they could access uh, Jefferson physicians, Jefferson nurses. It improved employee satisfaction. We found out it had less lost time at work. We then started early in 2015 
virtual realms. Gets back to that whole concept of what's logical. In 2014, in most places, if you had a parent in the hospital and you wanted to know what was going on, you would call your parent and say, did the doctor make rounds? Yeah, but I was half asleep. It was 5.30 in the morning. All right, well, put me over to the nurse's station. Could you have the doctor call me? Because I have no idea what's going on with my mom. Well, he or she is in the OR all day. Hopefully, they'll call you later tonight. Starting early in 2015 at Jefferson, we literally had our doctors press a button and patients at home or family members at home that they had designated could access those rounds and have two-way communication on their iPad, on their Android, or their, or their iPhone. We also did virtual discharges. Back in 2014, the number one cause of concern was readmissions. Now think about this again logically. Readmissions in 2014, you had hospitalists in academic medical centers that were taking care of very, very, very complicated patients in a very complicated technologic arena that had been referred by a family physician in the suburbs or, 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 or further away. Patient gets discharged, they're now under the care of that family physician and something goes wrong on Saturday. They really don't have a feel of exactly where that patient was. Send them back to the ER and very often get readmitted. Part of our virtual discharges, which started in 2015, is that the family physician's office is actually an active part, virtually, of our discharge process. Not only that, we had our hospitalists go out into the patient center medical home and become what we called extensivists and actually took care of the people for 90 days, by the way, with their cell phone numbers, with their ability to have two-way electronic communication. So if the patient or the family doctor's office had any question about what happened during that transplant, there were ways of communicating without having to send that patient back to the uh, emergency room. And then we got even more sophisticated in 2016. We started to use point-of-care telehealth during the discharge process, bedside telehealth, bedside telehealth to convene multi-party meetings when we need to have specialists, and point-of-care telehealth to provide schedule or urgent post-discharge follow-up. In fact, most of the discharge follow-up, especially given that we were mostly in Center City, did not involve patients having to come in and see us. What it did was, while it was very neat technologically, it also reduced our length of stay, it improved patient satisfaction scores, it decreased readmissions, and most importantly, it increased the engagement of referring physicians and patients at the time of discharge. They wanted to send to Jefferson because they knew they'd have a much greater ability to understand what's happening with their patients. Again, just like with the creating new doctors, we didn't just look around healthcare. We didn't just talk to our healthcare partners. We worked with places like Verizon, Comcast, other industries, and even American Airlines and US Airways. Why them? Well, we made a, another logical understanding that so many of our patients at Jefferson go places during the winter in Philadelphia. And we started to create virtual Jefferson Health in places like Florida, in Tampa, in Miami, in Palm Beach, so patients could access us in ways uh, that they hadn't been able to access us before. And we also learned from our mistakes. Believe it or not, in 2014, we still hadn't solved the terror human problem. We still hadn't understand that we have to fundamentally turn healthcare into a zero defect unit. We hadn't learned from our mistakes. <laughs> Just like that guy, um, we had enough warning, we had enough warning uh, that we really, really need to fundamentally change the way that we do healthcare. But we really, really hadn't done the things that we needed to do non-incrementally. So again, one of the things that we did at Jefferson is partnered with some unlikely partners. We partnered with folks in finance and even sports that had decreased uncertainty in those areas. So in football, for example, there's a company named EDJ Analytics that actually can tell Nick Foles or Tom Brady that given the weather, given the wind, 
given the defense, given what he's done to this point, there's a 68.2% chance that a screen pass will work in this situation. But in healthcare, we were still going based on our experience, based on anecdotes, based on some evidence, but certainly not to that level. So we didn't know, really, we couldn't tell a patient whether or not this cancer drug would work better than this cancer drug, at least with a meta-analysis on the spot. We didn't really know which intervention has the best chance of reducing readmissions. And what really changed the dynamic in 2015 and 2016 as the Affordable Care Act started to get rolled out is the issue where patients were making decisions with their own money. In fact, the people making $50,000 and $60,000 might have a four or $5,000 deductible. And the choice between going here for their knee replacement or here for their knee replacement might be $3,000. And it might be the doctor said, yeah, but that's because we use a better implant than those folks do. But they started to partner with places like Jefferson and our new company and saying, can I get some real data so that I can make a $3,000 decision based on the fact that I want to play tennis again and maybe it's worth $3,000, maybe it's not. So we created something called the Center for Healthcare Entrepreneurship and Scientific Solutions, which was, again, a partnership between our innovation pillar and our academic pillar. Well, we brought in some of the best people through our Still, by the way, in 2024, Jefferson has the only uh, school of population health. You'll be happy to know David Nash. Uh, but but um, where we were able to bring in people to bring predictive analytics and mathematical modeling to reduce uncertainty in medicine, but partnering with the folks in sports and finance that had done that so well using game theory and other big things. It reduced readmissions. It helped us in paper performance. We partnered using some of the big data that insurers have instead of viewing insurers as our competitor. We partnered with them. Uh, it really helped with consumer cho choice high deductibles. And uh, it really certainly created some real accountability in accountable care organizations. So again, partnering with new entities. In this case, we partnered with Georgia Tech, who had done a lot of the health systems engineering and a sports company called EDJ Analytics. And probably the best case study when I look at 2014 versus 2024 is that readmissions now are almost a reportable case. And it wasn't just because of the technology. Yes, telehealth helped, but it was partly because of the extensiveness. Again, our hospitalists now in 2024 monitor those patients for 90 days to make sure they don't go to the hospital. They're incentivized to make sure that any patient they saw in our academic medical center does not come back to the hospital. They do it through the patient center medical home. They do it through telehealth. Oh, and by the way, the other thing that's changed a lot in 2024 is it used to be if you said, where is Jefferson? They'd say, oh, that's on 10th and Walnut. Where is Penn? That's on 36th and Spruce. Where is, where is Temple? That's, a, that's on North Broad Street. Now when you say, where is Jefferson, people say, well, what do you mean, where is Jefferson? Is, do you mean the kiosks that are all around the state? Or do you mean on my TV with Comcast where it says sports, weather, apps, Jeff Health? Oh, no. Oh, you mean the hospital that's a lot less beds than it used to be on 10th and Walnut. Oh, yeah, that's, I guess that's still around, but that's not how we view Jefferson. And the same is true of all the academic medical centers in Philadelphia. And then the last thing we recognized, and certainly on a personal level I recognize, is that healthcare can't be the only area that doesn't get assessed for competency. I'm a pilot. When I moved down from Philadelphia to Tampa, and I brought my plane down to the airport there, they said, Look, before we're going to allow you to be on the, in the airport, we have to test that you're competent to, to fly. So I did half of it on a simulator, half of it in the air. I also hadn't practiced for a year and a half in Philadelphia because my practice insurance was so high. So I asked for privileges at Tampa General Hospital because we had sovereign immunity. And they checked the National Practitioner Data Bank, and they asked if I was, if I was um, certified and recertified by the American Board of OBGYN. I said, yes, I am. I got privileges. I was recertified by the American Board of OBGYN back in 2014 by filling out a multiple choice test. So the level of comfort that the first patient in 2010 that I put a laparoscope in her abdomen and did three-dimensional surgery in a two-dimensional plane, that I was competent, was that I could pick up a number two lead pencil and not go too far outside the lines. Simply put, in Tampa, you were a heck of a lot safer flying with me than being operated on me, at least as, as far as objective criteria. So we started to look at the aviation industry and what they had done, and we created a new educational paradigm. The whole concept of see one, do one, teach one is what any doctor will tell you how they learn. 
is great unless you're the one on the other end. And so we created a paradigm where we can translate medical advances and knowledge into improved patient care through procedure rehearsal studios. By the way, aviation has gotten that forever. When you get on an airplane, you know your, you know your pilot is competent. Because within the last six months, he or she has been within a mean and a standard deviation of competence. The last time anybody checked my technical competence as a surgeon was back in 1982, and that's true for almost all doctors 2014. This is actually from, a, uh, from an airline, Qantas. Dear Captain, my name is Nicole. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't mm, up the landing. Love, Nicola. So even Nicola, her mom might not have been thrilled that the only word she spelled right was the one I crossed out. But even, but even Nicola recognized that all that matters is taking off and landing. So really, back in 2014, these were three facts that were very scary to us and were part of our study. First of all, is that by and large, hospitals were helpless when it came to physicians with frequent complications. We had done one study. We went to 20, actually 22 different um, uh, healthcare entities, and we looked at docs that had had a couple complications, one in, four compli one in 400 complications within a month. Back in 2014, in some not so good hospitals, nothing happened to that physician. In the best hospitals, it would get up to a quality committee and they'd say, gosh, what happened to Steve? He's been here for 25 years. Um, we'd better proctor Steve. Now remember, they didn't know if I had a pre-neurologic problem, pre-Alzheimer's, pre-Parkinson's, substance problem. So they'd proctor me, and this is what happened. It was either my best friend proctoring me, who would say, look, Steve, I've known you for 30 years. I'm going to go over to the corner and do the Sudoku and sign you off. Or it was my biggest competitor proctoring me, in which case I said, here, let me give you the card for my lawyer. If you say anything remotely bad about me, I'm going to sue you. And by the way, I'm going to sue you personally so, so the hospital can't cover you. But again, thanks for doing this on behalf of the MedExec committee. So uh, not surprisingly, less than 3% of those folks did anything happen to. What was fascinating is when you look at, at the pilot world, if I'm Steve the pilot and I have one bumpy landing for United Airlines, I get an email, you will spend tomorrow in Denver on a simulator, and I pre-signed, if I'm ever not within a mean and a standard deviation, that I can get neurologic testing, psychologic testing, psychiatric testing, substance testing. If I get on the simulator, I'm within a mean and a standard deviation, I'm back at work the next day. If I'm not, I'm getting those testing, and I'm still employed, but I'm not flying you. So clearly, we recognize that that, that needs to change. The other thing we need to recognize is that as technology advanced, the whole concept of bringing in a new robot or using Google Glasses for surgery or any of the new technologies that happen and calling somebody competent by spending a day or two at the company was, was, was really wrong. And we recognized that having a learning curve made no sense when it came to patients. And again, the see one, do one, teach one philosophy of medical education really needed to change. So what we created is, is the largest assessment of technical and teamwork competence center in the world where we really start to create means and standard deviations. I like this one because I learned how to intubate a premature baby, a one and a half pound baby, in the middle of a chaotic delivery room as an OBGYN. With the baby screaming, with the mom screaming, with the dad screaming, with the nurses screaming at me, literally um, that's how I learned how to do it. Now for those of you who know anything about neonatology is the distance between the trachea and the esophagus is incredibly small. It's a technical skill that takes a fair amount of time to learn. Now, at least at this center, we don't let anybody do that until they prove that they can do exactly that technical skill, at least, uh, on, on, on a simulated baby. Totally changed uh, the, the metrics as far as quality and safety, and people started to recognize that their physicians needed to be not only cognitively competent, but technically competent. It's, it also changed the whole competence-based training model. Now, in 2024, Surgeons, OBGYNs, every five years have to get their technical competence and teamwork competence assessed as well as their cognitive competence, which actually seems to make a whole lot of sense, but didn't back in 2024. The whole continuing medical education world changed. Now, instead of needing X amount of hours of continuing medical education where you go to a hotel and watch somebody, all CME is online. But there's a fair amount of continuing teamwork and technical education that has to exist. Uh, which does require which does require travel. 
Back in 2014, healthcare reform had managed to confuse everybody. It says, actually, I'm not a doctor, I'm a healthcare administrator. That's okay, I'm not the patient, I'm his attorney. Nobody knew who anybody was uh, back, in, back in 2014. And what we started to look at, and many of us in academic said, medicine said, let's, let's stop talking about reform and let's think about transformation. So what became my, my Bible, I had three things in my office when you walked in. One was this which was a panel in healthcare that had an opportunity to participate in with NASDAQ, where we talked about what are the seven things that really need to happen. Redesigning and re-engineering care processes, making effective use of information technology, managing clinical knowledge and skills so there's decision support, develop, developing effective teams between healthcare providers. Probably the number one thing is coordinating care. Believe it, back, believe it or not, back in 2014, diabetics might see seven different doctors, none of whom communicated with each other. It's almost archaic now to think about that. Incorporating real performance and outcome measurements for true accountability and, and getting physicians to actually embrace and not fight change. And obviously everything changed from a, from a payment point of view also. We were, we were rewarding value, not volume, looking at purchasing and bundled payments, hospital physician integration, focusing on reducing readmissions, and, and really true transparency. And again, what I'm proud to say is that between 2014 and 2024, those of us that survived really understood that and got over it. So the way we did it at Jefferson to get to 200 and to exist to 200 is really, this is the second and third thing I had in my office back then. One of my favorite quotes was a Buckminster Fuller quote, you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a model that makes the existing model obsolete. And having to deal with a faculty that was often reticent to change, the other quote that I had in my office was from Mike Tyson, which said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And certainly back in 2014, we were getting punched in the mouth. So the ability to have our faculty, our staff say, well, some of this stuff sounds a little crazy, thinking about 10 years from now and doing it now, uh, but clearly uh, our current plan doesn't work. And probably the number one advice I'd give to you, coming from 2024 to 2014, is to start up to look at the game differently. Certainly, if you're a healthcare administrator, if you're an academic person, you need to look at the game differently. But we really started to look at really teaching our physicians and our staff how to get breakthrough bleeding, breakthrough thinking. Uh, so much, so much of my OBGYN thing came up every second. So, so much of what we had done was in board one. It was the same game. It was operational. It was by the rules. It was looking at just competence. We started in 2013 and 2014 to look at board two. Let's create some new rules. Let's question the rules. As providers, let's start to set the rules to create advantage and increase power and think strategically. Where it really changed, and the places that are doing well today, were ones that looked at very, very different kind of partnerships. Instead of just looking at what hospital system can I merge with, or what doctor's group can I merge with, it was, what company can I work with? What startup should we acquire or become part of? It was create what could be. And the, probably the number one recognition for our physicians was, on your entrepreneurial world, you have to stop thinking with the P less than .001 mentality. You always have to think that scientifically. But in the entrepreneurial world of thinking what could be, you're going to make mistakes. And it's not okay to make mistakes in patients. It's absolutely okay to make mistakes as you're thinking about a new world that's creating fundamental change and new and different opportunities. So we started to literally attract physicians into Philadelphia, nurses into Philadelphia, companies into Philadelphia, that for the first time were excited about having five academic medical centers that were willing to try things. And probably the number one thing that changed the Philadelphia landscape is that Penn, Temple, Drexel, um, Jefferson, uh, PCOM, Cooper, got over themselves and actually created a clinical research super site where literally there was a single portal where if you were Johnson & Johnson or you were a startup company and you wanted to access Temple patients, Penn patients, Jefferson patients, you had a single technologic portal to do that. And all of a sudden, Philadelphia became the hub of, of not just clinical trials, but entrepreneurial trials. So I mentioned to you that I'm getting an award for US News & World Report, and one of the things that's really changed is Believe it or not, back in 2014, we literally ranked folks based on things that made absolutely no sense and were true 30 years ago. So for example, ranking for medical schools were what your science GPA and MedCats 
of the people that got into your school. Well, places like Jefferson or Penn that have 10,000 applicants for 200 slots could get all people with four O's and 36's. They wouldn't be very good doctors necessarily, but they could do that. So what I'm proud of is that the Philadelphia schools in aggregate have won the award for the US News and World Report ranking in 2024, and it's very different. So on the academic side, pretty logical, but one of the things they look at for universities is how do the people that you do, that, that you um, teach, actually do? What are the personal and professional outcomes at one year, three years, and five years? Measures the individual's professional and personal happiness at varying intervals after graduation. Measures their emotional intelligence. Measures their ability to use technology for disruptive transformation. How did you do? What was the return on investment for that individual for going to your university? Believe it or not, it's almost the opposite of what it was in 2014. We're actually graded based on, based on collaborative quotient. Academic entities were incentivized to get over themselves and work well with others, as opposed to it being almost exactly the opposite in 2014, which now is sort of laughable to us. You actually had an entrepreneurial quotient, rewarding institutions that invent and envision new ways of doing things that generate alternate revenue and develop new student opportunities. So now, at Jefferson or Penn, you can become a full professor through an entrepreneurship and innovation track without ever having done NIH research or really doing other things that were traditional. And there was a disruptive quotient. You got extra point for, for investing in and creating ideas that fundamentally transformed academics. But even on the hospital side, there were some major differences. What we now get, um, what we now get ranked on is what, what's called the bub quotient in 2024, which is the believable, understandable bill. Rewarding health systems that provide understandable bills, with the understanding that that probably shows you have enough respect for your patients to not send them something that they can't read. We get, we get rewarded and rated on, rated on our ability to meet our own marketing claims. It's called the say what you mean and mean what you say quality parameter, so that literally uh, we have to deliver what we say. And one of the coolest ranking factors is we call the through the patient's eyes factor. Every one of our patients as part of our study, we give Google glasses. So we can actually look at what the patients are seeing when they're getting rounded on and in their daily, de in, in their daily activities. And then we have other hospital administrators look at those recordings and rate whether or not they would want to be at that hospital. So if I can give you one bit of advice as I get in my new 68 GTO hovercraft and accept this award, if I can give you one piece of advice coming from 2014, 2024 to 2014 is more than anything else, the world is going to change. It's either going to change around you or change with you. And what I would do is make sure that um, if you're an academic center or insurer, you're starting now. So thank you very much.